Good morning, Covenant College. Who's excited that it's finally October? I uh, was asked to make an announcement before we begin. Uh, you will see up here new open hall hours for the month of October. Your students sit. Your student senate did a survey last semester and in conjunction with Res Life and Student, student Development Office, they've come up with these hours to try. So give feedback to student senate and your RA this month and see if you like them. So. <laughs> teaser. This summer I was in a, getting my lunch in the blink. It's open in the summer for employees and student workers, and I was in there with a student worker, and we were waiting for our food to be prepared, and he came over to me and said, has anybody ever told you that you look like Tom Cruise? <laughs> now, in my heart of hearts, I'm thinking, well, you know, maybe at one time, younger, leaner version of me, that was true, but some maybe actually said that to me at one point, but what I said to him was like, really? Tom Cruise? He said, no, you look like Ted Cruz. <laughs> so in a heartbeat, my self-image goes from that to this. We're talking about pride today <laughs> and how that impacts our souls. We're going to look at the importance, got to get it away from that, looking at the importance of seeing ourselves correctly and of having a proper view of God and a proper view of others and how that relates to how we quiet our souls. What does it mean to have a quiet soul? What does it mean to have a noisy soul? When we think about noise, we think of it typically as something external to us. Music at a concert, a dog barking, cheering at a sporting event, construction equipment, it's something outside of us. But what about the noise that only we can hear? And I'm not talking about what we have on our iPod or iPhone with our earbuds. We're talking about the noise that's inside of us the noise of our very soul that is often deafening and anxiety-provoking. In the past eight years here at the college, we have administered every other year the National College Health Assessment, and we've seen in eight years a 10% increase of students who reported experiencing overwhelming anxiety at one point in the past 12 months. And our data matches up with national numbers. We are an increasingly restless and anxious people with increasingly noisy souls. As I was preparing for this talk, I was thinking, well, what would it be like if we could actually view one another's souls? That is our, our spiritual, emotional state of being. When we look at one another now, as I'm looking at you now, everybody's pretty well put together. We're, we're pretty good at appearing put together. We look maybe a little something like this. Smiles, thumbs up, cheery attitudes. And for, for many of us, that, that may be how we, we really feel. But if we could see our souls, the life that we keep hidden, how we are really doing, what, what does a noisy soul actually look like? What does anxiety look like? And would it look something like this? And maybe the question to be asked is, where does the noise come from? And what can we do to quiet it? 
I believe the answer is in Psalm 131. I also believe that God's word read, God's word rightly applied, hidden in our hearts through the power of the Spirit can bring change. If we take this word, that we read it, we believe it, we hide it in our hearts, that it actually has the power to transform us. I'm going to ask us to do something we don't normally do. I want us to read this psalm together. I want us to read, read it with hope, with anticipation, and seek the Lord's wisdom. Let's read together. O Lord, my heart is not lifted up. My eyes are not raised too high. I do not occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me, but I have calmed and quieted my soul. Like a weaned child with its mother, like a weaned child is my soul within me. O Israel, hope in the Lord, from this time forth and forevermore. Let's pray. Gracious God and loving Father, we thank you for this psalm. We acknowledge our restless and noisy souls our hearts that are lifted up in opposition to you. We pray that your spirit would take your word and use it to lead us, to calm our souls, that we might know peace in you. Father, may I preach for your glory and not my own. Get me out of the way so that we might hear what you have to teach us today. We pray this in the powerful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Foundationally, the psalm is showing us that humility is the way to a quiet soul having a proper view of self and a proper view of God. Psalm 131 is not describing a personality type, but a learned posture, a quieted and calmed soul that is actually trained in us. But to learn how to calm and quiet our souls, it's essential that we diagnose the characteristics in our hearts that contribute to the noise and restlessness we feel at all times. It's important that we recognize that there's a particular progression of pride. Notice this movement from our hearts to our eyes to our minds and how we think. David starts with, my heart is not lifted up. We know the heart to be the center of who we are. So it shouldn't be surprising that David starts here. When our souls are restless, when our souls are noisy, it begins with lifting up our hearts. Soren Kierkegaard wrote that it's the normal state of the human heart to try to build its identity around something besides God. Pride begins with an inaccurate view of who God is and who I am in relationship. As we lift ourselves up above God, that produces a distorted view of our soul that results in either self-exaltation or self-loathing. Regardless of whether I'm loving myself or hating myself, the focus is always on me, and the noise begins. In the same way, anxiety begins when someone's trying to love equally both God and some created thing, oftentimes myself. And Jesus makes clear that to try to love the creator and any created thing equally is impossible. Matthew 6, he says, no one can serve two masters. Either you'll hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to one and despise the other. At the heart of pride, is the attempt to find our ultimate hope, our ultimate comfort, our ultimate meaning in something other than God. A noisy soul is a sign that you've lifted your heart above God. When David says in verse 1 that his heart is not lifted up, he's describing himself in relationship to God. He's essentially saying, that's what I was. Previously, Lord, I lifted myself above you, I worship created things, I worship myself, but now I've seen that that only leads to anxiety and noise and ultimately death. The pride doesn't stop with the heart. It progresses. It's not just about me and my relationship with God. It's about me and my relationship with other people. David goes on to say, my eyes are not raised too high. Once we've lifted our hearts, our our eyes follow. If hearts lifted up demonstrate that we believe we are right in our own strength, then eyes raised too high show that we seek to justify ourselves by comparing ourselves to others. We raise our eyes too high in pride and turn others, our peers, into rivals. We put ourselves over 
or under them in competition and poisonous comparison. We measure ourselves constantly against those we encounter, and we end up again either self-exalting or self-loathing as we compare ourselves to them. In our minds, we create scoreboards where we measure the successes and failures of other people and compare them against our own, because ultimately, the, the noisy soul is never content with being successful. It's always about, was I more successful than him? Was I more successful than her? The noisy soul's not content with the 92 on the exam, only whether that 92 was higher than everybody else's. It's a vicious cycle that feeds on itself where we don't actually like ourselves very much if we're in the presence of someone who has done better than us. The reality of having eyes raised too high is we don't find joy in anything other than being able to compare ourselves favorably to other people. The thing is that whether we are looking down on other people or looking up at them, we are miserable and the noise continues to build. When you think you're better than someone, you fear being surpassed by them and so you can't celebrate their successes with them without worrying about how it impacts your own standing. When you think they're better than you, you don't really respect them in your heart, but seek opportunities to criticize and to root for their failures so you can feel better about yourself. At all times and in all ways, your glory is central to what you do and your heart cannot rest as it strives for more and more glory. glory. There's a, a beautiful hymn we sing in our church from time to time. It's titled, Father, I Know That All My Life. It's by Anna Waring. And she wrote this around 1850. I pulled out two verses here. I just think they're so powerful and appropriate. The first one I want to share is, I ask thee for a thoughtful love through constant watching wise to meet the glad with joyful smiles and to wipe the weeping eyes and a heart at leisure from itself to soothe and sympathize. A heart at leisure from itself. And what a great phrase that is, a heart that's actually able to rest, to not worry about its own glory, to be able to be not uh, so self-focused that you're unable to love other people and rejoice with them, to have eyes lifted to the point of seeing needs and trusting the Lord to meet whatever needs she might have. She goes on, so I ask thee for the daily strength to none that ask denied, and a mind to blend with outward life while keeping at thy side, content to fill a little space if thou be glorified. That last line always gets me. Content to fill a little space. Now this psalm isn't anti-ambition. Pursue as much space as you can to God's glory. But when it becomes about you, perhaps the space needs to decrease. But let this be our prayer, that we would be content to fill whatever space the Lord has given us without dying that death of comparison and envy with our eyes lifted too high. So this natural progression of pride moves from lifting ourselves up to comparing ourselves to other to eventually trying to be God. I do not occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me. In short, we try to be God when we pursue and try to control things that only God can control. It's the natural outworking of thinking that we are God. We attempt to control things that we can't, and it always, it, it always ends poorly. One way we play God is by trying to control other people. We desire their acceptance and their attention, and we're willing to do whatever it takes to get it. Whether that be through manipulation, people-pleasing, flirting, lying, or, or, or any other means, we play God by attempting to manipulate people to get them to notice us and choose to spend time with us. Maybe it's through exaggeration of our needs or embellishment of our past. Maybe it's through the jokes we tell, the comments we make that put others down, or maybe it's the way we laugh at those jokes or are silent at the comments because we want to be accepted. But what's particularly sad about playing God is that in the attempt to be God and to control others, 
we are the ones who become controlled. Controlled by what they might think about us. And in the end, when I occupy myself with things too great and marvelous for me, when I try to play God, I end up in bondage to those very things and perpetually anxious. As a result, my soul is steadily strangled. Counselors call this codependency. We desperately want and need other people to love us. As a result, we're controlled by those we believe can give us what we desire. So instead of a loving and worshipful fear of God, we have a fear of others and care far too much for what they think of us as we helplessly attempt to control situations that are out of our control. And we crumble under the weight. We try to play God, and the results are disastrous. Playing God without actually being God leads to resentment of God and an increasingly noisy soul. The reality is, we come by this naturally. We know the story of Lucifer, who sought to be God and was thrown out of heaven. We know of Adam and Eve, who believed Satan's lie and tried to be like God, only to be cast from the garden. And the author of this psalm, King David himself, has learned this the hard way. He was brought low by his attempts to play God as he sought to control the situation involving Bathsheba and Uriah. He sings this song to us now because he knows that the proud soul is noisy, that it's frantic, that it's always anxious, and it fears being found out and proved to be a fraud. The noisy soul, the lifted up heart, will always feel threatened and insecure. It's a profound truth repeated throughout Scripture. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. This, of course, is of tremendous encouragement to the humble, but for the proud, it's a dangerous warning. To know that God is actively in opposition to my proud, lifted-up heart means that there is no rest for me, no quiet for my soul, I must stay on the lookout, stay on the run, lest I be hunted down and crushed. And this is no way to live, living in perpetual fear and insecurity. Is it any wonder that we keep spinning ourselves into the ground in our anxiety? But we don't have to live this way. The humble and quiet soul is peacefully at rest. It's not relying on itself its achievements, its comparison to others, all things that ultimately fail and give no hope, but it rests in that which is strongest, that which is the most secure. David Pallinson, a Christian counselor, tells us that we cannot destroy self-will by sheer will. <clears throat> We're simply not strong enough. I can't just say one day, I'm going to stop being anxious. I'm going to stop trying to control other people. The reality is, not only are you not strong enough, but you're actually too strong. You need the help of something outside of yourself. In the same way a drowning person needs someone from outside of the water to pull him or her out. Only one thing is strong enough to overpower the noisy soul. It's God's promises in and through Jesus Christ. Being loved by Jesus through the power and presence of the Holy Spirit, it was Christ who actually is God who did not consider equality with God to be grasped. Unlike Lucifer, unlike Adam, unlike Eve, unlike David. This is our hope. There's no better place to be than to be in Christ, resting in the truth of what he has done on my behalf. That I can't be taken from the Father's hand. That I'm free to be who he created me to be, his dearly loved child. I don't have to measure up to the standards of other people's opinions of me because God's opinion of me is unchanging, rooted in the completed work of Jesus Christ. Trusting in my own work, trusting in anything other than him, leads to a noisy soul. What's so interesting about this psalm is that David has known what it is to not care what other think, others think about him. 
Remember, as a young boy, he marched right into Israel's camp as they were there on the brook, on the shoreline. The cowardice of Israel frustrated him to no end, and he spoke his mind about Goliath's arrogance against the living God. In that situation and others, we see he's, he knows what it is to utterly depend on the strength of his God. But we also know David's story all too well. He's also lifted his heart, and raised his eyes, and attempted to play God. Over all of that, though, he has known the forgiveness of his God. And nothing humbles a person quite like forgiveness. The reason David is able to calm and quiet his soul is because in humility and through the grace and goodness of his God, he has been able to lower his heart, to lower his eyes, and trust God to be God. He has an accurate view of who he is and who his God is. The path to a quiet soul, the, the antidote for codependency, is not to love yourself more, but to fear the Lord. God must be bigger than you are. God must be bigger to you than other people are. The life of pride is fearful and insecure. The bigger that I think that I am, the bigger that I think other people are, the less safe I actually feel, and the noise of my soul becomes deafening. But the smaller I become, the more secure I feel. It's the great antithesis of the gospel. The less I need glory, the less I need approval from other people, the quieter my soul becomes. The calm and quiet soul that David enjoys is likened to a weaned child, and what, what a beautiful image that is. Those of us who maybe have um, children, those of you who've had little siblings or have babysat, you know what it is to have an unweaned child, the, the infant that is irritable and restless. It's demanding, it's, it's rooting away, fretful and fearful about getting exactly what it needs. Fearful that it won't get enough, simply viewing the mother as a means to an end. I need this, give it to me now. These are all childish versions of our own anxiety, our own anger, our jealousy, our fear, our discontent. Instead, think about a weaned child, simply resting, so content to just be on its mother's lap, content just to be. There's no other place that a child would rather be. Quiet and at peace. A learned quiet, a learned peace, complete trust, giving up control, comfortable with being totally dependent and helpless. We talked about that being perhaps the picture of our soul at times when our souls are noisy. But don't you want this for your soul? If our souls looked like this, trusting simply in our Father, in the, his infinite supply that there is plenty for all, there's no reason to worry about whether God's goodness and love for us is going to run out. His mercies are new each day. He cannot and will not forget or fail to bless. The weaned child trusts this. Life with God in Christ is like a contented child in the lap of his or her mother. That's what our soul longs for, but we seek to achieve it in so many other ways rather than in the only way that it can be achieved. There, there are no, no shortcuts. There are no cheat codes. There's no tricks. There's no microwave discipleship. It's a lifelong work of faith. And I wish there was an easy way, a quick answer for me to give you, but there just isn't. A soul can find rest in one place. It requires us to drink deeply of the truth of our God, to seek to know him more, to participate in this process of quieting our souls. One of the most critical ways we do this is to become more dependent upon him. Whenever Jesus talks about his relationship with his father, he becomes childlike, very dependent. Listen to Jesus' own words from chapter, uh, chapter 5 and 8 from John. The Son of God can do nothing of his own, the Son can do nothing of his own accord. I can do nothing on my own. I do nothing on my own authority, but speak just as the Father taught me. Paul Miller has said that Jesus is, without question, the most dependent human being who ever lived. Because he can't do life on his own, he continually prays and prays and prays to his Father. 
When Jesus says, apart from me, you can do nothing, he's inviting us into his life of dependence on his heavenly father. We forget that helplessness is actually how the Christian life works, not in lifting our hearts, but in surrendering them. We receive Jesus because we were weak, and that's how we are to follow him. Secret to the Christian life is simply being able to say every day, I give up. I surrender control. I choose to practice helplessness and dependence on you, Father. When I realize that I'm nothing in comparison to Christ, but I'm everything when I'm in Christ, then I can begin to see myself properly. I'm not worthless. I'm actually Christ's work. That's my hope, not my work, but his work in me. David ends this psalm with one last exhortation. O Israel, hope in the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. These words are given by God to shape our hearts, to change our posture, but it takes time to practice and to learn. I developed a peculiar habit this summer of following a a particular chiropractor on YouTube. TMI, I'm sure. I don't even go to a chiropractor. It was just very interesting to me and I have, a, I have a bad back. First thing he would do with his patients is he would have them sit down on a table and say, sit how you feel most comfortable. And every time, they were slumped over. And he put his fists in their back and gently push them forward and pull their shoulders back. And he said, my job with you is to make what is comfortable uncomfortable. I thought about that since hearing that phrase. This psalm is attempting to put us into proper posture, to make what has been comfortable, uncomfortable. But it takes practice. We need to rehearse the promises of God to lower our hearts, our eyes, to make what is uncomfortable and unnatural into something that is comfortable and second nature. This psalm has words of rest for our restless hearts. We we struggle with all kinds of restlessness, noise and anxiety and worry, fear of missing out, uncontrollable worry at night, being overwhelmed by all we have to do. But these are God's words to our noisy soul. David experienced much restlessness in his life, pursued by his enemies, confronted for his sins, dysfunction in his family. But here we see him having learned how to rest, how to quiet his soul. And David is making sure that his people, the people of God, understand that there is no hope outside of the Lord, that all of their hope is to be placed in the safe refuge of their covenant-making, covenant-keeping God. Charles Spurgeon, in commenting on this psalm, has said that it's one of the shortest psalms to read, but one of the longest to learn. Will we trust what Christ has done for us? Will we put our hope only in him? The psalm is simple, but it takes a lifetime to learn. I'm 46 years old. I've been a Christian for 37 years and I'm still learning it. So I encourage you to take this psalm. We read it together. Read it more. It's easy to memorize and use it to diagnose your heart, to correct your posture, to lovingly correct one another's posture. Hide it in your heart and learn it in order to quiet the noise of your soul. In conclusion, let me just say, true rest comes from a calm and quieted soul. We make the mistake of thinking rest will come once our situation has changed going from single to married, going from unemployed to employed, getting a new job, uh, new friends, different roommate, let me get past this test, survive to the weekend, let me transfer colleges, let me lose weight, gain muscle, cut hair, change wardrobe, change major, change churches. The list can go on and on and on, but true rest is a spiritual condition. Our soul desires to be a weaned child, but the unweaned child in us continues to want and to need and to be based on circumstances. David came to the place where he could experience quiet and calm in spite of his circumstances. Circumstances are far too transient and fleeting to produce true rest. Circumstances are always changing. The well becomes sick, the rich become poor, the employed becomes unemployed, a friend may become an ex-friend. Our health changes, our relationships change, our finances change, our feelings change, but true rest comes from a relationship with God that never changes. David was a man after God's own heart. He was God's anointed king, but he believed the hype 
of his circumstances and the privilege as a king, and he took what he wanted. His eyes were raised too high. His heart was lifted up. He played God with the lives of others and wrecked their lives and his. But David's story is our story. It's, it's a redemption story. His sins, his presumption, his pride, it was all forgiven. His repentance and forgiveness brought humility as he developed an accurate view of himself and his God, and this equipped him to sing this psalm. Years later, Jesus Christ came out of the line of David, and he succeeded where David had failed. He practiced obedience where David had sinned, and Jesus sacrificed his life, sacrificed his life where David had lifted his own up. Our rest, the quiet for our souls, was purchased and secured by Jesus. Put your hope in him and him alone. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the certain truth of your promises. Have mercy on us, Lord. May your spirit enable us to lower our heart and our eyes to let you be God and to know truly what it is to embrace our dependence as we trust in the certain hope that is ours in Christ. We pray this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Go in peace.